Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's ILTA webinar titled Data Discovery and Classification, a Swiss Army Knife for Privacy and Security Compliance, sponsored by INSA and Spirion. Today's presentation will run about 60 minutes, and we ask you to submit all questions to the Q&A or chat boxes. Scott will pause periodically to answer questions. Before we start, please know that we are recording today's webinar and we'll post a link to our website under recordings soon after today's presentation. At the end of the presentation, we will ask you to take a few moments to complete the evaluation poll that will appear on your screen. I'll now turn it over to Scott. Wonderful, thank you. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for Joining us here today, I'm Scott Giordano. I am our general counsel at Spirion, also our vice president of corporate privacy. Um, some of you may know me from my e-discovery days um, when I was involved in uh, many aspects of e-discovery uh, from consulting to technology. I'm also taught the first e-discovery legal class anywhere in the country. So I spent a lot of time on the legal tech side of things. And in fact, spent the bulk of my career in legal tech. So if you all leave with nothing else today, I'd like you to leave with the following. Um, if it's powered by electricity, it probably produces personal information. I know that sounds a little bit hyperbolic, but uh, bear with me. I think you'll see as we go through the presentation that that is indeed, um, indeed true. Information security and data privacy laws and regulations are constantly being passed into law and are converging into what's called data protection. If you spent time with GDPR, you're already familiar with this idea of data protection. This is something that's becoming a very North American thing, if you will. Even if they don't affect you directly, these laws do so indirectly, and it's typically via contract. And I read contracts as part of my job um, pretty much much of the day. And so uh, you're gonna find, and as I found, that much of uh, contract law nowadays addresses privacy and security regulations. And then finally, data classification is a powerful way to address all kinds of data protection requirements. And so I like to think of it as a Swiss army knife for compliance, and hopefully at the end, so will you. Um, also, if you have questions, please send them in, and um, I'll answer them as we go through the presentation today. So without further ado, I want to give you a very brief history of privacy and data protection, and I divide this into two two eras, if you will, uh, the one before Edward Snowden and the one after Edward Snowden. And that may sound a bit, bit strange, but, but uh, stay with me here, I'll show you why. So this is a very condensed version of uh, privacy and data security in both North America and then the rest of the world. And not surprisingly, I couldn't include everything in here, but I tried to include things that I thought were uh, particularly poignant. So if you think about the first half, if you will, of, of uh, the, the world of data protection and privacy, the first half of that from 2013 and before that, it was very particular in terms of applying to say healthcare or applying to um, financial data or applying to something that was very specific. This is called a sectoral approach. This is what we do in the US. Um, Canada took a different approach. And if you notice at the top left, you see Pepita, uh, which is uh, Canada's generally applicable privacy law. That is uh, in contrast to the US's sectoral approach. So two different ways of doing the same thing in North America. What's interesting is that those uh, those actions, the passages of all of these laws and regulations, again, very deliberate, very narrow in the U.S. until the Edward Snowden revelations in 2013. And then everything changed. That had a profound impact on the development of the GDPR, which was still being drafted at the time. I did, uh, read a lot of the history of GDPR and the Edward Snowden revelations really changed the dynamic in terms of how personal data was being protected. And so as a consequence, that developed and matured into the GDPR we have now, which then had impact on US law because US law looked at GDPR as a model. So the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which was passed about a month after GDPR uh, went into effect. I remember that very vividly because I worked on GDPR projects. And so GDPR had a very profound impact on that. And then as a consequence, we saw changes in 
approaches to protecting personal data. So we had the NIST privacy framework, for example, that came out a couple of years after that. We had updates to California's uh, privacy law, the California Privacy Rights Act. I'll dig into that in, into, into a, in a minute. But the net net of it is that we saw a big change in how personal data was being protected as a direct result of Edward Snowden. And that was reflected outside of the US. So if you look at privacy laws that were passed post GDPR, like the LGPD um, improvements to uh, privacy in Korea and Japan, uh, New Zealand, you're going to see that much of that was um, owing to GDPR. So you can see that Edward Snowden really created this entire new body, if you will, of data protection that likely would not have taken place as a consequence. I'm going to pause there. Um, uh, Kevin Tracy, any, any comments, questions, anything coming in? Uh, not at this point. Thanks. Okay, so then let's roll forward. So uh, data protection laws in Canada and the US. What you're going to find here is that these laws are converging to this idea of data protection, essentially saying that we've taken two disciplines, data um, security, data privacy, moving them into one discipline. So you're looking at protection of data holistically instead of trying to separate the ideas of privacy and security. And I'll give you some examples. So here in the US, we have five now rights-based uh, data protection laws. And so we say rights-based, meaning that like the GDPR, which is rights-based, that there are certain rights that are granted to individuals. So the right to know what kind of personal data a company is holding about them, uh, right to have it deleted, have it amended, to get a copy of it, a couple of other things as well, um, rights to ha not have the data sold or have it specifically targeted. It varies somewhat among the five states that have passed thus far. So right now we have one law in force, that's the California Consumer Privacy Act. The California Privacy Rights Act will go into effect at the end of this year. Um, also, a couple more of these laws will go into effect um, during the course of 2023. So essentially we've got about five uh, rights-based laws. We also have about 45 or so risk-based laws. These are the traditional risk-based laws, meaning that as a data controller, as a business, you are responsible for evaluating the risk to consumers versus the benefit to the processing of the data that you're doing. And so you create that balancing act and then you put appropriate controls in place as a consequence. That's risk-based, that's very traditional in the US and it's changing over time to a rights-based model. Canada um, does a similar uh, approach in the sense that there is both at the federal level and at the provincial level, but there it's not exactly the same. So you're probably all on the call familiar with PEPITA. Uh, it addresses, it is a generally applicable privacy law, data protection law in Canada, much like GDPR in the sense that it protects all kinds of personal data, things you would expect like your, you know, your name, your ID number, um, your ethnic origin, things of that nature, but it also does things which I think are very, very interesting and it, it, it protects opinions about your evaluation. So think about things that are employee reviews, for example, um, or other kinds of evaluations. Credit records are protected, not surprisingly, loan records, medical. So things that are addressed with several laws in the US in a, in a sectoral model, they're pretty much all wrapped up and covered at the federal level uh, with PEPITA in Canada. Um, Canada also has a privacy act that applies to the governments, the federal government's use of personal information. This is not unlike the Privacy Act of 1974 that we have here in the US. Also, there was a proposed um, bill, uh, Bill C-11, to enhance privacy in Canada and create an enforcement mechanism. Um, that was the Consumer Privacy Protection Act and then the Personal Information and Data Protection Tribunal Act. That did not um, go into effect. Um, the law did not make it, but the proposed law did not make it, but that was um, fairly recently being considered in Canada. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, I would not be surprised to see that make a, an appearance. Okay. Also at the provincial level, um, the, the various provinces have the ability to create their own data protection laws that are more or less the equivalent of the federal level. And it's not exactly the same model we use in the US. Um, uh, here in Canada, uh, you'll find that there is more latitude at the provincial level to, uh, to create laws. So here you're gonna see very specific laws. Um, you have the Alberta law, which addresses cross-border data transfer, um, the Ontario law, which applies to, to healthcare, the Quebec law, 
that prohibits cross-border transfers of public sector data and so forth. So, so many, uh, if not just about all the provinces have some type of specialized uh, data protection law that applies to them. Um, as a consequence, it's not surprisingly, a certain piece of data may have all kinds of different qualities about it depending on which province it's located in. I mentioned earlier about this idea of convergence of data um, information security and data privacy. So if you take a look at the GDPR, which is really our, our, our model for almost everything, you'll see that there are both privacy obligations like um, getting a legal basis for collecting personal data. There's also a security aspect to it. In this case, Article 32, uh, implementing technical and organizational controls based on the risk. So this idea of having privacy and security obligations, this really is the present and the future. This is how everything is going. So the California Consumer Privacy Act takes the same idea, almost verbatim, disclose to the consumer what personal information you're collecting about him or her, um, delete things on, on request, uh, have transparency of privacy practices, but also implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices appropriate to the nature. So whenever you see appropriate to the nature, it means risk-based. So it, it essentially copied a lot of the good stuff from GDPR. Did it copy all of it? No, but it did a very, very good job of what it did do. Um, a parallel law, this is NYDFS part 500, this is very security focused, security oriented. It's really dealing with financial institutions, which are very broadly defined in New York. Um, however, there is also this privacy implication that the CISO has to report any kind of material uh, cybersecurity risks. Presumably, that also uh, applies to the confidentiality of non-public information, NPI. NPI is basically just another way of saying personal information, but from a financial institutional perspective. Okay, so let's talk about finding and classifying sensitive data. Those of you from the e-discovery world, probably very well versed with finding data, and we're gonna talk about data discovery versus e-discovery just to, to have some clarity here. So um, as a general rule, uh, if it's powered by electricity, it probably produces personal information. Um, when I worked way back when in e-discovery, this would have been slightly different. If it's powered by electricity, it probably produces ESI. So those of you in the e-discovery world, uh, you can see where, where I really got this idea from just based on my own experiences there. This applies to online identifiers. So GDPR talks about online identifiers, and this is one of the very subtle things about the law about the regulation that it applies to uh, things produced by devices, applications, tools, and protocols. And you might say, well, gee, Scott, that sounds like anything. And you're right, it is. Just about anything can be personal data as a consequence of this clause in GDPR. So examples, IP addresses, uh, both static and dynamic. Um, I've had many heated discussions with uh, IT administrators many years ago who thought that the idea of dynamic IP addresses being personal data was absurd, um, but this is, this is where we are. MAC addresses, cookies, anything dealing with mobile devices. So your IMA, your IMSI number, unique identifiers, log files. Log files are chock full of personal information. So the net net of it is that quite literally, if it's powered by electricity, it probably produces personal information. So let's talk about the challenge of finding sensitive data. So we talk a lot about personal data, which is great. It's important. It's, it's you know, part and parcel what we do. But um, working in the legal profession, not surprisingly, this idea of attorney-client privileged information or solicitor-client privileged information, that's sensitive data as well. And it merits its own protection. Trade secrets. The, the challenge with trade, trade secrets is that if the secret is exposed to a third party without some kind of privilege attached to it, um, then the trade secret's gone. So trade secrets are very brittle, much like attorney-client or solicitor-client privileged information. Confidential communications, this gets overlooked. Think about the hack that happened uh, versus Sony some years ago. Uh, one of the things that happened was that a lot of confidential communications, internal communications within Sony um, were exposed to the world, and it created a lot of embarrassment for Sony because there were some um, uh, unpleasant things that were being said in those conversations that weren't meant for the general public. So that created um, some, some embarrassment. Um, also, there is this idea of export controlled information. Um, I spent some time in the defense industry, worked um, with, uh, uh, we had a Canadian subsidiary, so I worked with the control 
Goods Program, the CGP, um, and then with ITAR, which is the US version of that as well. So um, those of you in the e-discovery business are probably familiar with this idea of pattern matching. Um, the problem is with pattern matching is that pattern matching only takes you so far. Um, I've used CREP and regex and all those fun things, um, did that many, many years ago. They're great, but they give you a huge amount of false positives. And one of the bigger problems is this, this subjective nature of sensitive. If you have an email that says that you're going to go visit the on oncologist next week, well, okay, that you and I know that that implicates something very big medically, but is that something that a pattern search is going to be able to find? Probably not. So that's the challenge we have here is that just because you have a pattern matcher doesn't mean you're really going to find things that are in context and you're going to find a lot of things that just aren't relevant at all. Um, Kevin, um, comments, questions, anything um, thus far? None at this point. I've okay. actually invited everyone to put any, any questions or comments okay. they have into the chat and okay. Q&A. Wonderful. Um, talk about data discovery versus e-discovery. So when we talk about data discovery, this is an automated purpose-built process for locating responsive information. So when I say responsive, meaning that we're looking for something very particular because of the nature of the law that's, that's regulating it or the nature of the contract that's involved or there is some other operational reason why you have to find that data uh, to make other things work. So it's different from e-discovery. And I get this question all the time. Well, isn't, isn't data discovery the same as e-discovery? No, it's not. When you search in e-discovery, you're trying to find information that helps you advance some legal theory. That's the whole point of e-discovery is that you think that um, one party is in a dispute with another and they're wanting to look at particular information because they have a legal theory they're trying to advance. So it's not particularly well attuned to finding certain categories of data. It's not well attuned at all to finding personal data or um, uncla um, controlled unclassified information or other kinds of data. It's just not really geared for that. It's geared for finding concepts. Um, and I spent a lot of time in e-discovery. It's very good at finding the things that you're looking for in terms of maybe a party was negligent, maybe a party said something that um, was inappropriate, whatever it is, finding that kind of, uh, of information is very good and very, I guess, powerful for me discovery, but finding to say just personal data, given that it's very subjective, it doesn't do a very good job of. File classification, occasionally people ask me about file classification, say, well, is that data discovery? No, it's not. It's really a statistical method for getting an idea of what kind of files, how many Excel files, how many PDFs do you have? I mean, it's great from a perspective information governance, but it's not really designed to help you find personal information. DLP, data loss prevention. Um, data discovery is not the same thing as DLP. DLP will take with whatever you have, in this case, labels and be able to get a very good idea of what information to retain or, or not to allow access to, but it can't by itself find personal data. It just really wasn't designed to do that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Also in terms of other search methods, I mentioned earlier that I've worked with regex, I've worked with grep, all those fun things. Um, Boolean, worked with that extensively. Those are great, but that's not really gonna find very efficiently uh, personal data. It's just not geared for doing that. It's geared again for pattern matching and finding things that uh, look like a certain thing, like a phone number or a social security number, which is great in and of itself, but it's not going to find everything that you're looking for. And it's not going to find it in context, more importantly. So talking about the role of data classification, so really getting into the meat of this idea of, of why we care about data classification and why it's so important. Um, it's this process of analyzing, it could be a file, a document, a communication, and then you apply one or more labels to it that show how it should be controlled. So who can access it, um, how it should be protected, how long it should be retained. Um, that's a, a big component of information governance and it's really a subset of, of just protecting personal information in general. If the information is not there in your system to be exploited, then bad guys simply can't do anything about it. Um, it's a process because it involves regulations like GDPR and then the policies that uh, result from them and the expectations that you have, the control objectives that you have and the controls that enforce them. And these things get in, uh, developed and implemented over time. And I'll, I'll help you visualize that um, in a couple of slides here. <clears throat> 
has to be repeatable and defensible. Um, you've probably heard that phrase a lot in the discovery world. Same thing here, it has to be repeatable and defensible. Otherwise, there's no way to create that consistency that you need. And uh, the joke is there's always a lawyer. This was um, one of the CISOs I worked for loved to say, there's always a lawyer, meaning that there's always a legal implication to everything, regardless of the industry that you're in. And, and he was right. Data classification really answers this question of, of what information do you have? Where is it? How is it being controlled? How is it being uh, retained or disposed of? And what's important about this is that once you have this information, once things are classified, you have a very good idea of what kind of information you have. And it gives you the ability to, to justify and prioritize the controls that you're asking money for. So if you have certain kinds of information that are amenable to certain controls, you're gonna to wanna to say to, to the CFO, hey, we'd like certain, uh, a certain degree of money um, to buy these controls and implement these programs because we have a very good idea of exactly what information we have, um, how sensitive it is, and how it needs to be protected based on all the laws that map to it. So that's the beauty of data classification. It really helps you do that. And then if something goes wrong or when something goes wrong, you can get a very good idea of exactly what was in scope and be able to report that to the authorities or to affected parties. Um, I've talked to folks that have some have given me some debate about this saying, you know, I can't get good information in 72 hours, which is what GDPR requires. Also, the US DOD requires that as well for its own data. As an as a practical matter, three, three days, 72 hours is what you've got. And having data classification makes reporting on that in a meaningful way now possible. So I mentioned earlier that I'm going to be sharing uh, the big picture model with you. This is it. This is the data classification management framework that we've developed at Spiron. Um, some, some very, very talented people at the company have, have developed this. Uh, essentially, in a nutshell, the way this works is you take things like laws and norms. So um, the GDPR, for example, um, or uh, PEPITA or the uh, HIPAA. Uh, whatever whatever laws and norms that you have in your culture, and those become policies and then become procedures. And baked into that is this idea that there's going to be guidelines and standards and frameworks. It could be NIST, it could be ISO, it could be both. In North America, we have both uh, access to NIST and ISO. And while NIST seems to get used more, um, ISO is very highly respected. That all gets baked into your procedures. And then also there's a risk calculus. So most of these laws will incorporate some mandate that you create controls or implement controls according to the risk. So that risk calculus takes place. And then in the discovery process, the mechanical process then gets applied to artifacts, to documents, to files, to communications. And then finally, it gets classified according to different criteria. And then that classification, those labels can be read by different tools, by a next-gen firewall or a, or a DLP or what have you. And then from there, the controlled artifact either moves, does not move, um, is available to some but not others, gets deleted, et cetera. So that's in a nutshell how data classification management works. This model really will take you far because it covers all the essential elements of, of, of the big picture. Um, also, I'll take a minute to go a little bit deeper here. So here's a different way of looking at data classification. In the core is the matrix. This is, and I'll share this uh, to you all in a minute. This is the matrix. So this is the uh, relationship between sensitivity of data and the controls that are being put into place to protect it. Then you have a policy that wraps around that quite literally. So you'll have a policy that says, based upon sensitivity of certain information, these controls are mandated. On top of that are tools. So tools, um, automated tools that will help you discover and classify information. And then finally, monitoring and audit. So this is your monitoring or reporting um, and audit. So periodically you're going to review and make sure the tools actually are doing what they say they're doing, a la Sarbanes-Oxley, for example. We talk about the matrix, the different relationship between sensitivity and the controls are being put in place. Here's the, the way that I think the, the safest way to read a document like this. If you look in the middle, uh, middle column, if you will, I'm sorry, the middle row, where we talk about the severity of the consequences of mishandling, then you're going to see that the, depending on the nature of the impact, the nature of the controls in place is going to be commensurate with that. And this is a real data classification matrix. It's actually a subset of a much larger one I developed. Um, so I was given permission to show this portion of it. But uh, the original one was seven, um, seven categories. This one is four. The number of categories isn't important per se. It's really the degree of control that you're able to put on a given kind of data. So if you look in the third column, 
class three proprietary and sensitive. I've got personal data um, or personal information that's from the not US. I have HIPAA control data for the US, attorney client privilege materials, et cetera. So these are the things that merit yellow um, uh, category because they could result in significant adverse impact to an organization. As a consequence, um, and in summary, um, access is restricted to certain named individuals and groups. Um, uh, you have to include appropriate notices regarding the sensitivity when you share it, et cetera. So this is the, the control summary of it. And then for every media, uh, every medium rather, you'll get different sub controls. So for example, an email within uh, a company, an email sent outside the company, for example, electronic file transfer, et cetera. So just different media um, being able to have different controls or to be able to, to append some kind of designation saying this is P3 or class three or what have you. And then finally, if you uh, look towards the bottom here, you'll see some individual data elements that are labeled with the individual color. So you can look at it and go, oh, okay, I see I've got this kind of data here. I've got that kind of data there. It makes perfect sense now. Given I'm gonna pause, um, questions, comments, thoughts about uh, anything I've talked about thus far. Nothing is coming yet, Scott. Thank okay. you. Okay. So let me talk about data classification in practice. I think that's gonna be um, offering the most, um, most assistance here um, for us. So in practice, um, we have different kinds of requirements. You have your regulatory requirements. So you've got GDPR, you've got PEPITA, um, you've got HIPAA, CCPA, CPRA. So the, the regulatory and probably the most well-known uh, reasons why you want to have data classification in the first place, because these are being uh, the drivers. However, contractual drivers, in my view, are just as important. And in many cases, people don't realize they're contractual. So PCI DSS, I think it's easy to think of PCI DSS as a law that's somehow been implemented, but the reality is it's, it's just uh, and I put quotes around just, it's just a contractual requirement. So the, our legal system doesn't require this um, as a part of the regulatory environment, but still, if you don't follow PCI DSS, you won't be able to process payment cards, and that could be essentially the end for some, if not many businesses. Also, BAA, um, Business Associate Agreements, essentially a, a, a parallel contract with a, a healthcare provider. Um, we use those extensively here in the US and I imagine they're used extensively cross border as well. Standard contract clauses. So this is something that is appended to a data protection, uh, data processing addenda. So standard contract clauses, uh, those of you that work in multinational data security and privacy probably have come across these. Essentially what they are is quite literally a standard contract that you don't change the terms of, and that defines the relationship between the parties, um, one party exporting data out of the EU, and then one party importing data into the US or into another country. So that's a contractual requirement. Um, the US uh, Department of Defense, uh, the ITAR and DFAR rules, in many ways, they're implemented as part of a contractual um, negotiation. They're not a quote unquote law. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Again, many people think that these things are, are just simply laws, but they're not. They're, they're quite literally contractual requirements or purchasing requirements, if you will. And then finally, operational requirements. You may have data protection by design and by default, meaning that you're processing the minimum amount of personal data that you need to in order to effectuate some, uh, uh, some event. And so as a consequence, you're taking a look at the data saying, do we really need this and keeping what you really need and getting rid of the rest or just designing your operations so that they're just using the minimum amount of data possible. So that's an operational requirement. Again, labeling uh, of some type is gonna be required as a consequence. And you might ask, well, okay, that's great. You know, what does that look like? Well, uh, here's a good example of this. This is a sample Excel file. And if you look at the top left corner, you can see that there's different kinds of labels. And um, like um, you can see IIPI for individually identifiable personal information, NPI, um, non-public information, and so forth. So a given document could have any number of labels attached to it. And each one of the, label, each one of the labels is going to have a different meaning. It's going to apply perhaps to a different control. It may be giving you um, how long the document is gonna be retained, with whom it could be shared, uh, what laws apply to it, because you could run reports on just what data applies to what law, and as a consequence, have an idea of what kind of controls need to be uh, um, applied. Um, Kevin, um, comments, questions? Yeah, there is a question here. Sure. 
Isn't there a global common model for data classification that will work for the majority of these needs? Example, restricted confidential internal external data classification with tagging for these regulatory contractual or operational needs, e.g. PII. If there is, I have not found one. And uh, the, the uh, data classification model that uh, I showed a couple of slides ago, that was the result of a tremendous amount of, of research we did into this area. And we could not find a single set of labels that would be universally applicable. It's just something that at this point is much more art than science. So I don't see that happening anytime soon. There's just too many subtleties attached to a given piece of data to really have that universal model. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, if you wanna see what goes on behind the scenes, um, you can see here that those same labels um, are now visible um, and you can see basically in the metadata um, towards the, the bottom third of the screen, you can see IIPI, NPI and so forth. So same idea uh, is just you're, you're taking a X-ray, if you will, of the document and looking at the, uh, the metadata and looking at it from that perspective. If you're wondering, gee, is this what the uh, DLP or the next gen firewall or you know, anything that really look at layer seven data, is, is that what it, is, is it's looking at? And the answer is yes. It's reading that and going, oh, okay, this is IIPI or this is PCI. I'm gonna do certain things or not allow certain things. This can't leave the network. This can't leave a subnet. This can't be uploaded. This can't be downloaded, what have you. There's gonna be a certain rule set associated with a label or labels. So not only is this a control in the sense that you're able to run reports and get an idea of what kind of information is controlled by a PCI agreement, but you're also able to use that as a mechanism um, for your, what I call allied technology like DLP to say, okay, I'm just gonna put a control here and you're just, you're not leaving the network, for example. Um, give you another example of this. So um, for uh, control goods or for ITAR, um, say you have a document here that has certain information that uh, can be only exported under certain conditions. So here I've got this um, controlled classified information, um, CUI. And it's also cited as ITAR, also cited as class three. Remember earlier we had that table, that, that uh, matrix that had different classes. So different ways of articulating the same exact idea. And these are all labels that are embedded in these documents so that allied technology can read them and go, aha, now I know exactly what I'm supposed to do with it. This is also the behind the scenes. So again, taking an X-ray, if you will, of the metadata, you can see how this looks. So this is something that would be read again by a, um, a DLP, next-gen firewall, um, anything that can really understand layer seven data. This is the kind of thing that it would take a look at and go, okay, yep, uh, I know exactly what to do with this data. So let's talk about different scenarios here and what might apply. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with all kinds of cloud services and how they apply to different industries, uh, like the health, healthcare sector, for example. So a given, and we'll take a scenario here, say that you are a CSP, cloud service provider in Canada, but you are working with clients here in the US, um, specifically in um, addressing medical data. There's all kinds of things that need to be taken in consideration. Um, whose data is it? Is it simply uh, Canadian data? Is it also US data? Um, if it is, if you have patients on both sides of the border, then that complicates things because more laws, more regulations are gonna apply. So we know PEPIDA is gonna apply uh, in Canada at a minimum. HIPAA applies at a minimum here in the US. There, depending on what province uh, the data is located in, other things may apply like Ontario's uh, PHIPA. So these are regulations at a minimum that are likely gonna be applied. And then there's the security standards and frameworks. Um, you remember earlier I talked about and showed the model where part of the calculus, if you will, of, of how you're implementing policies and procedures, you're baking into this idea, different security frameworks and standards. So uh, for healthcare in particular, ISO has 27799. It's part of the 2700 series that you're likely familiar with. NIST has SP 800-61 addressing healthcare. So good example of standards and frameworks that you may be incorporating, perhaps not necessarily without realizing you're using that standard, but using the controls that you were um, being asked to use. Um, also contractual requirements. So there's gonna be a BAA, almost certainly, um, if you're working with someone in the US, likely also in Canada as well, that business associate agreement is just a list of to-dos and things you're not going to do, more importantly, with that healthcare data. 
and that has to be enforced mechanically using a um, data classification. Same thing for a data processing addendum. This is the traditional way of protecting data that was crossing borders out of the EU into the rest of the world. And DPAs go way back. They go back to the data protection uh, directive, 1995. Um, they've been around for quite a while and I've spent a lot of time pouring over these things. They also now contain these standard contract clauses in many cases. So you can see these are things that get baked into it. And as a consequence, you wanna add labels uh, that can be read by uh, allied technology. And then the technology can then assist you in putting controls on the flow of information. So you may have HTLH for healthcare data. You may have PAHIPA, you may have CB for cross-border, all kinds of different ways and ideas of putting labels in that are indicative that the, the data you have is protected by multitude of healthcare regulations, security standards, and contractual requirements. Um, to the left, you can see um, a document published about a year or so ago from ANISA, which is the, the rough equivalent of, um, of the US CISA. Uh, it's uh, been around quite a while, and uh, this is the EU version uh, of that agency, and they publish all kinds of documents and, and white papers on data protection. Financial services. So um, institutions have all kinds of regulations um, that they have to follow. So probably the second most heavily regulated industry in the US vis-a-vis -vis healthcare is going to be um, financial services. So regulations, again, if you're a, a bank and you're doing cross-border uh, banking, then you're going to be uh, working with Pepita again at a minimum. You'll have GLBA at a minimum here in the US. Likely we'll run into NYC part 500 because it's so prolific and because so many uh, banks are licensed in the state of New York. So as a consequence, their operations are governed in part by Part 500. Um, you have a, a, a EU mechanism called PSD2. So if you're working cross-border with the EU, that's going to be applicable. And not surprisingly, what kind of standards and frameworks? It's going to be ISO 27001 at a minimum um, for cross-border uh, compliance. And then the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, those of you familiar with, with the CSF, I mean, it's been in, um, in use for probably, I'm guessing, eight to 10 years right now. And it became the model for the privacy framework, which essentially is the cybersecurity framework applied to personal data. Contractual requirements, um, I mentioned earlier PCI DSS. Um, also a data processing addendum, again, uh, would be applicable for cross-border information. A good example of this also is if you're a bank and you're, say, in the US, but you are processing data uh, for, on behalf of a bank in Canada or a bank in the EU, for example, even though you may not be necessarily subject to Pepita or sub subject to um, GDPR, contractually, you're going to be subject to it because the your, your customer is going to make you as a practical matter. And I'm saying this based on personal experience um, in practicing law. So you're going to have that that you have to uh, abide by, even if the law doesn't apply to you directly. So potential labels, GLBA, 2701, PCI DSS, you get the idea. So different scenarios require different labels that are indicative of different kinds of data protection. Protection of trade secrets. Um, what you're seeing on the right hand, uh, right half of the screen is the um, criminal prosecution of Huawei. And this was based upon theft of personal information, or I'm sorry, theft of proprietary information from T-Mobile um, some years ago. And you can see that this was um, part of a larger effort to protect um, the theft of, uh, or prosecute the theft of trade secrets. And so um, as a consequence, if you have a document that is a trade secret, the idea is that you wanna put a label in there that's gonna be indicative of one, it's a trade secret. So proprietary information, for example, or prop in or TS for trade secret, but more importantly that that's going to implicate certain controls that a uh, ally technology would read and go, okay, um, this can only be shared with certain parties, for example. So you can see how granular that this can get in order to protect personal or proprietary information. Another example is control goods, or in the US, we have the ITAR. So the same idea of protecting certain kinds of technologies from leaving Canada or leaving the US um, only under certain, um, certain standards and then under certain government programs. So the F35 program, for example, um, or other programs where 
uh, there's an export of technology to allied nations, there's still certain standards that have to be applied. And it's very easy to get into trouble with this. And, and, and I used to work for a defense contractor and it's amazing how you could easily be exporting, uh, and I'm using air quotes here, exporting data without realizing it. Um, and subject to the ITAR, subjective to the controlled goods program. So as a consequence, having these kind of labels, so having CGP, having the ITAR, DFARS, what have you, export, very crucial for identifying that kind of information that is, um, is required to be controlled under these programs. Violating these programs will bring down the hammer. It can, uh, it can get you disbarred um, or delisted essentially from a list of uh, contractors that the Canadian and US governments will work with. So um, uh, it's a, the consequences of getting this wrong are pretty big. Um, questions, um, comments, um, anything that's, uh, that's uh, come up thus far, um, Kevin? Nothing at this point, thanks, Scott. Okay, so let me um, go in and talk about a couple other things then. So um, for further reading, uh, there's a couple things that I want to want to share with everyone. So on the left is is the NIST data class classification practices document that came out last year. Um, we at Spirion um, shared the uh, the chart that I showed you earlier, the model, if you will, data classification model, um, with. Um, with NIST. Um, we've never heard back from them, but we shared that with them um, as our view on things on how to uh, how we believe the world um, should look. So this is a great document worth reading, worth picking up. It goes into some detail on different industries, and um, uh, I think uh, I think it's worth a read. Also, um, there is this controlled and classified uh, markings document that came out, again, about two years ago or so um, from US DOD. Um, I draw a lot of really good inspiration from the DOD on these kind of things. They have a lot of incentive, not surprisingly, to really get data classification right. Um, even though you're not likely going to be using their labels, like top secret and secret and what have you, the, the, the idea behind it is still absolutely sound. And uh, so it's a great way to draw inspiration and to see how other folks are doing it. Thanks Questions, Scott, just to Kevin? Interrupt. Yep. Um, there is one question. Yes, the uh, copy of the presentation, I believe, will be shared out by Tracy at the end. Um, there is a question here. Thoughts on opportunities, challenges in data management technology with regards to data labeling and classification. Example, pro would be would pro would easier to have a multi multi CSP on prem strategy. Con ransomware labeling of sensitive data may make it more visible to target. Well, that's true. Um, if you make it easier for you to find personal data or sensitive data, sure, you're gonna make it easier for the bad guys to find it as well. Um, however, let's flip that on its head. Bad guys are already very good at finding personal information. Um, one of the things that keeps, I, I study this, not surprisingly, quite a bit, and I read a lot of after action reports, especially um, on GDPR, because they publish them. And what I find in a plurality of cases is that the data that gets stolen is data that the victim didn't even know they had on their system or didn't know why they had it, which is you would think that that's pretty shocking. But in the plurality of cases, that was the case. They've got data and I'll, I'll, I'll give you, um, you know, Equifax, that whole debacle. Uh, much of that data was data that um, Equifax UK didn't realize that Equifax US had. Uh, and so when the UK authorities investigated, um, uh, Equifax UK couldn't really come up with a good explanation why Equifax US had that information on UK persons. So it's a great example uh, of how you have to have a very good idea of the, of the personal and sensitive information you have in your information ecosystem. Now, will that make things easier if bad guys break in? Well, sure. I mean, if you're, I mean, if your house is very well organized and there's a big arrow that says valuables are right here in the safe, yeah, it's going to make it easier for them to find it. But still, it's up to you to put controls that are in place um, or models like zero trust, for example, to keep the bad guys out in the first place. It's a good question. Um, other, other questions, other comments from anyone? Okay. Sorry, um, yeah, there is a comment, sorry. Oh, sure. Well played, well played, sir. Cold data off the inventory radar is the bigger security exploit. <laughs> so I'll come <laughs> into your response. Okay. 
Thank you. Wonderful. So let me offer some conclusions and uh, give some more um, more opportunities for you guys to ask questions or play stump the privacy dude or whatever it is we want to do. Happy to, uh, to take on you know really anything that you have. Um, data discovery and classification probably the most cost effective tools for promoting information security and data privacy right now. Why is that? Because if you're labeling everything or laboring the things you care about, then you've got a very good idea of what you have, where you have it, who has access to it. This is what's remarkable, is that when I see uh, data, uh, just failures in general about personal or sensitive data, uh, almost always it's because a, a third party that has access to data has done something stupid. Okay, it just there's no way around it. But your third parties, parties with whom you're sharing the data, maybe again you're in a, they're part of your supply chain, and you have to share the data in order to conduct business, and they don't have the same level of discipline that perhaps you do. Um, having those labels in there that can be read presumably by their technology, it's hard for them to argue that that they can't control the data. You've already done all the hard work. You've labeled things. You've um, listed them as whatever, it could be, uh, could be medical data, it could be financial, it could be controlled unclassified information or CUI. Those of you working in the defense sector um, in Canada and the US, well-versed with this. Um, one of the challenges that all of the laws governing export of, of uh, data um, to, uh, to technical data outside the US and Canada, one of the challenges was that um, folks didn't have a good idea of what was considered controlled and classified information. Well, simply putting that in the label in the metadata resolves that issue pretty effectively. Kevin, is there a question? There is a question. I sure. think you're gonna to get to it further on, but I'll, I'll put That's it okay. out here now. Uh, any recommended reading or certifications to take to gain more education in this area? Boy, I wish there were. I really do. Um, I showed you those two documents uh, a slide ago and they're very good reading. Unfortunately, I had to create this out of whole cloth. And, I'll, I'll, and I'll, since we've got a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll share the, the story with you, is that um, I was at a defense contractor some years ago. And uh, I, I think the second week I was there, literally the CISO walked to my office and said, we need a comprehensive data classification system that can address all of the legal requirements, whether it's contracts, it's, it's program requirements, it's operational, it's legal, it's everything. Everything's got to be addressed by this. So then I had to start from scratch. And believe it or not, I looked at uh, the UK's um, uh, healthcare system, they had a pretty extensive data classification system already set up. And it was all on paper. I don't know how well they implemented it electronically, but on paper, it looked great. So I used that as inspiration. I got DOD documents. I used that as inspiration. I, I just did a lot of reading. And, and it, I spent the better part of about nine to 10 months just building out this entirely uh, complex system. It, it was so big, I printed it out. It, it should, I put it up on a wall. I mean, it was massive. And that was the first draft of this. And so you had to put a lot of thought into it. And then I had to sell this to a data protection committee and say, hey, this is a great way to protect our data because this label corresponds to this program and this label corresponds to this requirements and so on and so forth. And so it was a lot of work. And so basically I had to just teach myself how to do this. And it was just a question of reading, working with some brilliant people at the office. And over time, this thing was just banged into shape. So I wish I could offer a better, uh, a better way to get there from here. But unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, it's still an art. It is not a science. Um, we're not there yet. It's going to be a while. But um, if anyone on the call here is interested in, in my sharing ideas with you, feel free to send me an email. I'll put my email in the uh, last slide here, and you can. You know, I'm happy to talk to you guys. Um, data protection regulations, um, they now apply globally. You saw the slide that I started off our discussion with, um, and they're very similar, um, just out of necessity. They're very similar, and they, they tend to look at the same things more or less as personal information. They tend to ask you to do the same things, to put in certain controls and to control who gets access to what. Uh, the, the EU can, I think, be credited really with making this what it is today. And you know, while I have some criticisms uh, of how things have been implemented, overall, I think they've done a darn good job. There's been at least a thousand enforcement actions over the past two-ish, probably three-ish years um, since GDPR went live. 
done a great job overall with it. And we can learn a lot of lessons. Um, just reading GDPR after action reports, whenever someone gets punished, you can learn a lot. And so I think that's the best way to help build out your program and understand how these regulations apply to you. You don't have to be a lawyer. You just have to be curious and, and, and energetic in, in developing your own program. Um, data classification is as much a political process as it is a technical one. So here's the thing is that suppose you have a certain kind of data and one person says it's class three and one person says it's class four, who wins? Um, that's one of the challenges that you have. That's why you need a data classification committee or a subcommittee. Maybe you have a larger data protection committee, uh, but you need a data classification subcommittee so that you can have point someone to say, okay, look, this, this type of data, whatever it is, it's medical data, it's class four on a, on a four tier system, or it's class three or what have you, but you need some political resolution that says, we're going to protect data like this, and we're not going to allow people to put on their own labels, otherwise you'd have utter chaos. Um, I've heard some people suggest, oh yeah, I want to do my own labels. Uh-uh, no, you don't. It would just, it would make a disaster out of the whole thing. You want to have one system that everyone agrees. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good. And everyone is on board on that, and they're going to implement that. So what do you need to, to get there from here? You need an executive sponsor. If you don't have someone up higher up in the organization that's willing to, to do some log rolling to get this going, it's not going to happen. You need a steering committee or steering committees to make sure that you've got all the right stakeholders on board and everyone's really uh, has a seat on the bus. You're gonna need subcommittees uh, for the matrix. The matrix is, is the hardest part of this whole thing because you really have to have controls that are very granular to what you're trying to control. If you don't, if you have this general purpose control for everything, people are gonna get frustrated and they're just gonna work around it. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the old story that I've told way too many times. Um, I had attorney client information originally as class four. Um, or as yeah, I think it was a class four on my matrix way back when, um, which prohibited faxing documents. Why? Because unfortunately, attorneys tend to leave things on the fax machine way back when, when we did fax, faxing on fax machines. Um, I could not get that policy implemented. So I had to put it into class three, which allowed faxing of things because I couldn't get lawyers in the department to stop using fax machines. That's not a problem anymore, not surprisingly, but back then it was. And so a lot of times you have to get your controls that are in line with your corporate culture. Otherwise people are just gonna work around them. And then there's no point of having everything labeled if people aren't gonna respect the labels. So you need committees for the matrix, you need committees for the policies. What happens when someone violates the policy, this all has to be thought out. And because you're putting, putting all this thought into this ahead of time, uh, and all this energy ahead of time, you're multiplying the benefits across your enterprise because now everything, every kind of piece of information is touched by these labels. And so there's not ever a question about, well, what should we do with it? Um, because you have a matrix that shows the, the controls need to be in place. You have a policy that says you've got to use this to protect X data. So it's all, all the work is done. There's a lot of work up front, mind you, but once you do it, then the benefits really multiply across the organization. Also, your supply chain members are going to look at you and go, wow, these guys have their ducks in a row. We want to work with them. We want to use your system. So you're really multiplying the benefits across your enterprise and with those that you're working. Kevin, yeah, I'm going to pause there. Any other um, questions, comments? We've got about five minutes left. I know there's a poll coming up, so I want to make sure I respect that. Um, not at this point, Scott. Um, <clears throat> just want to mention the, the advantage of the Spirion with the discovery. It all begins with discovery. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is our Privacy Please podcast. If you've not um, had a listen, please do. We have some just brilliant people that are guests on these podcasts, um, and the podcast team is, is awesome. Um, always love listening to their, to their podcasts. Um, that's me. Um, feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect with you. Um, these are some links to some NIST privacy um, uh, uh, framework documents that I've created. Feel free to uh, download those and have a look at those. And then um, this is Kevin's contact information as well. And um, I just want to thank um, Kevin and Inza and Ilton, everyone, for having me on today. Um, I really enjoyed, enjoyed this. And um, we've got a couple of minutes. If people want to ask questions or you want to run the poll or whatever you guys want to do, um, I think we're good. Thanks, Scott. I'm going to go ahead and pop up the uh, evaluation. Okay. Uh, it, people can go ahead and take a um,
take that opportunity to give us some feedback. Uh, thank you, Scott, for uh, an informative, information-packed uh, session. Um, we will be posting the recording under uh, the recordings link on the ILTA website. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody on future education. Um, and have a great day once you complete the poll. Thank you, Scott and Kevin, uh, Insa and Spirion, of course. Thank you to everyone that joined and Scott, Tracy, Mary Beth. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Scott, could you back your slide up one? There was an sure. email address slide, I think, that sure. people wanted me, to see just one more time. Okay, let me see if I can minimize this and, and go back up. Um, hmm, there we go. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, thanks everybody. I am gonna go ahead and um, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. Um, we will be posting the recordings again. And if anybody has any questions, um, refer to the, the slides with uh, Scott and Kevin's contact information. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.